then let's talk about Blur. Not the band, um, but the phenomenon, which I guess they were as well. Um, is Blur necessarily a bad thing in an image? There could be times where it could be good, right? Where's an example where you might want to have Blur in an image? What if you're photographing, hmm? Ooh, you could catch movement with Blur, couldn't you? Like, let's say uh, you had, uh, well, this truck running down the road. If you used a really fast shutter speed, everything would be nice and, and sharp. Uh, and is the truck broken down? Is it stopped in the middle of the road? But by using a bit of a slower shutter speed, you can capture movement. You can see the background whizzing by. Um, not just motion blur in this case, also some radial blur. You can see the tires whizzing around. So you really get a sense that this thing is moving. So motion can be an important part of an image. Imagine if this was done with a fast shutter speed. It would be a bunch of kids sitting awkwardly on the mud laughing hysterically. It wouldn't make any sense. You need that motion blur to get the feeling that something's going on. Um, the background becomes just a, an abstraction. Maybe you're photographing the Tour de France, and maybe you want to make it more about the location, this beautiful European village, the background, and you want to see the cyclist whizzing by, so you set your camera up on a tripod, get a bit of a longer exposure, you know, an eighth, a fifteenth of a second, and as the cyclists go by, you click the shutter, the background is nice and sharp, but you can get this blur of motion of the cyclists going through. Although that's not what happened here, they've got the opposite. The cyclist is sharp, and the background is blurred. How'd the photographer do that? panning with the subject. As the cyclist went by, he kept him in the center of the frame, did a click. Same thing with the big truck. The guy was panning with the trucks, the background blurred as it went by. So you can use the blur to focus on the subject, let the background go soft. Um, same deal here, panning with the cyclist as he goes by. Uh, or you could do the opposite, lock off the camera, and in this case, everybody knows what the London buses look like, but the telephone booth might have looked weird as a blur. So they locked it off, got that iconic telephone booth, that iconic bus moving through. So you're kind of using different examples of movement within the frame. Oh, this is one that I took. This is the old view from my balcony at uh, Bathurst and Portugal Square, Bathurst and Adelaide. And a longer exposure, you can see the streaks of the lights as the cars drove around the corner. And I like this part here. You can see the guy had his turn signal on. So you can capture a sense of motion in an image. So yeah, motion, good thing for getting a sense of action. What else could blur be used for? What about pulling attention to a subject? Like what, let's say you had a, a field of wildflowers and there's this one flower that you wanted to just look at this flower. If you use a small aperture and you get a huge depth of field, you could have that flower in focus, the flower behind it in focus, all the flowers behind them in focus. It becomes this riot of color and detail, but which flower were you trying to get people to look at? What if you used a really huge aperture, got that really shallow depth of field, focused on that one and let everything in front and behind go soft? That would really kind of lock the viewer's attention onto it, wouldn't it? Um, so you can use it for kind of focusing people's attention. Now, when you let things go out of focus, like take a look on the screen for example. Imagine these were like, you know, Christmas lights or, you know, uh, street lights off in the distance. If, if these lights here were out of focus, how would it look? Like this, a little soft puff ball, like a Gaussian blur, or would it be a hard edged circle like this? Hard edged circle. Like if you've ever seen like a picture of Christmas trees or something, um, here's an example of what are called circles of confusion. When something is out of focus, it makes a circle on the sensor. If it was like a forest where there's leaves and stuff everywhere, you wouldn't notice the circles. If you get a specular highlight reflecting off of a lake or little pinpoints of light in a Christmas tree, or just to get a, an idea why this makes a circle and not a soft, hazy puffball, imagine I had an LED flashlight, really bright pinpoint of light, and I set it on a shelf over there. And then I tried to take a photograph of it. So I set up my camera, and my lens is round. The aperture inside the camera is round. So that flashlight is going to be shining the light all across the wall behind me. The only light we care about is the light that passes through that aperture on my lens, that circular shape. So imagine a circle going all the way down to a pinpoint of light from that flashlight there. If you have a circle that goes all the way down to a pinpoint, what three-dimensional shape does that make? You could put ice cream in it. A cone. You get this cone of light coming from the flashlight to your aperture. And then what does the lens do to that light? Bends it, refracts it, bends it down, and focuses it onto your sensor. So here's your aperture. You got this cone of light coming from the flashlight through your lens, down. And if the tip of that cone from the other side, there's your aperture, another cone comes down. If the tip touches your sensor, it's in focus. You get a pinpoint of light on your sensor from that pinpoint of light on the wall. But imagine your sensor wasn't right there. Imagine your sensor was a little bit closer. Maybe you weren't quite focused on that 
light back there. So now the cone of light comes down and it's focused behind your sensor, but your sensor is cutting the tip of that cone off. If you cut the tip off of a cone, what shape do you get? A circle. And that's what's happening here. That cone of light was trying to focus somewhere else. We interrupted the cone and it makes a circular shape. So all the light that that flashlight was putting out that passed through here, instead of getting focused on a tiny pinpoint, which would have been really bright and probably blown out, is now spread across a circular shape. And the larger that circle is, the more that light is going to be spread out and it'll be a little bit dimmer. So you can see where they overlap, they get a little bit brighter. Or maybe instead of the, set, the, camera, you know, the lens being too close and it cutting the tip of the cone off, what if it lens is a little further away? That cone of light comes down, hits here, there's that little pinpoint, and then the beams will cross over each other and another cone will come out the other direction and the bottom of that cone will hit the sensor. So whether you're too close and cutting the tip of the cone of light off or you're too far away and those light beams have crossed over and made a second cone, the bottom of that cone, which is also a circle, is going to make a circle of confusion. And here's an example of an image where the light's off in the distance, there's circles, and if we go to this bench here, it's focused on this edge of the bench, nice and sharp. But then as things get closer, they degrade back into circles again. So whether it's focused in front of or behind the sensor, you're going to get those little circular shapes. Do they have to be circles? They don't necessarily, do they? What if you did something like, like this? What if you cut a little piece of cardboard, cut a little shape in it, and tape that on the front? That becomes the aperture of your camera. And you could get out of focus things that look like this. Uh, now this isn't from a piece of cardboard. This is from, you guys ever heard of lens babies? Yeah, they're deliberately crappy lenses. They started out fairly simply. It was just a simple doublet lens, just two little lenses. And they were kind of soft around the outside, but they had this sharp spot in the center. And the lenses themselves look like an accordion. Uh, and you focus by squishing it or letting it release, and you can bend the tip of the element back and forth to kind of move that sweet spot of focus. They have a huge range of lenses now. Um, but one of the things they had was the Creative Aperture Kit, which was basically little metal discs with a, a different shape. Instead of round, if you have a star-shaped aperture or a heart-shaped aperture, you end up with star or heart-shaped bokeh. Um, they call it the Creative Bokeh Kit now because, you know, bokeh is like the inward now that phones can, you know, add artificial bokeh behind stuff. And usually it's pretty tacky. Maybe you're doing like a, a, a Valentine's portrait, so you got some candles in the background. That one's actually not that bad. It's kind of cute. Um, but you can see whatever shape your aperture is, that's the shape the bokeh becomes. There's some star-shaped bokeh or star-shaped bokeh. So, you know, kind of tacky, but there you go. It doesn't have to be a circle. So what can we do with all this stuff? Well, let me just quickly run through some of the blur filters that are available to you. You can just follow along on the screen here. Uh, this is a picture of a star field. Just, I didn't take this. This is, I think, NASA did this one. But those little pinpoints are a good way to kind of show you what these different blur filters are doing. So I'm just going to run through them, show you what each one does. Filter, blur, well, average, it's pretty average. It just it's, Imagine your photograph was wet paint and it just got all smeared all over the place. It becomes an average of whatever all the pixels were. Kind of boring. Um, next one down, filter, blur. I'm going to skip over blur and blur more because there, there's no dots at the end. Like dot, dot, dot means something else is going to pop up. These are useless. But box blur, well, probably also useless. Uh, it kind of simulates having had a square aperture on your camera. You'll notice that every little pinpoint of light becomes a square. And also notice the larger you make the radius, the dimmer each individual square becomes uh, because of that light getting spread out over a larger area. So yeah, I can't think why you'd want to pretend you had a square aperture on your camera, but there's your box blur. Uh, filter, blur, Gaussian. You guys are all familiar with Gaussian blur. And for the longest time, if we wanted to fake something being out of focus, Gaussian blur was all we had. Basically, it takes the pinpoint and it it falls off the brightness according to a Gaussian transfer function. Um, so you get those soft faded edges, kind of like a bit of a bell curve. But eventually they came up with better ways. And actually, I'm going to skip over the lens blur for now because it's not just a better way, it is a really freaking awesome way. So I'm going to skip over that and we're going to come back to it. Um, but motion blur, let's talk about this one. Let's say you were shooting the Tour de France and you wanted to make it look like that village was, you know, kind of blurred out in the background. You could run a motion blur filter. Or maybe you were doing a uh, a story on the subway system and you were waiting at the subway stop and as the subway came in you wanted to get that that blurred subway and maybe you caught it too late and it had stopped moving. You could 
add a little bit of fake blur to it this way. Uh, you can play with the distance, which is how far the lines move, as though it was going faster, it would have more of a streak to it. You can play around with the angle, which is the direction. Uh, this feels like the tripod leg broke, and this is right before your camera hit the pavement. So that's the motion blur filter in there. Filter, blur, radial blur. Now you might notice that this dialog box looks like it hasn't been updated in decades because it hasn't. Um, you don't get an actual preview. You get to decide where the center of the blur is. Um, and well, let's say you were doing um, a portrait of some kids on a tire swing and you know, they were spinning around, they were laughing hysterically and it was a bright day. So you were shooting at like, you know, a thousandth of a second. It would look like they're just sitting in a stationary tire swing laughing hysterically, which would be kind of weird. With a radial blur, you could do a little bit of a spin to it and suddenly it looks like they're spinning around now you see why they're laughing and having so much fun um, the other way of doing the radial blur equally actually I'm going to show you the radial the other one on a different image well let's let's say you wanted to put some kind of sense of interest on this this image right here so we did a filter blur let's do the radial blur again filter blur radial blur like I said it's kind of a crappy little preview here and you're like, oh, I want the radial blur to center from their faces. I guess their faces are maybe around here. You hit OK and how did I do? Wow, I totally missed. So you'd undo it, filter, blur, radial blur, um, and you just have to move it down. Maybe around there, we hit OK and whatever this comes up, we'll say that it's good enough. Whew, that's kind of disturbing actually. But the nice thing is you can throw on a layer mask and with a bit of a lower opacity, maybe, you know, 50% or so, we could bring back the sharpness in certain areas. So you can get this combination of sharp and blurred. So you can kind of use it to um, creatively enhance an image. And that's actually going to be the assignment for today. I'm going to get you guys to play around with some of these filters. Try a whole bunch of different stuff. Just get a feel for what these filters are capable of. And your favorite three, you'll save them up. The other of the radial blurs is the... You'll probably recognize this one from... Um, any Star Wars fans when they're going to Aldebaran? Yes, excellent, there you go. So you'll recognize this one. Or maybe when you were doing that uh, subway um, article, you were at the front of the subway going down the tunnel and you wanted that streaking effect as you came into the, uh, into the station there. And maybe you didn't get enough, this could kind of fake it. Or maybe you, you had uh, attached your camera to the spoiler of a, a Formula One race car and it was whipping down the track but, you know, being a really bright sunny day, you were shooting at like a two thousandth of a second, it looked like your car was stopped in the middle of the track, more of a hazard than a winner. Um, you could, again, kind of add a little bit of blur to get a sense of motion into it. Uh, and that's the radial blurs. Hopefully someday they'll update that filter, but I've been waiting for years and they haven't. Now shape blur. If you've got an older version of Photoshop, you'll have a different set of icons. Uh, you can make a custom shape with the pen tool if you wanted to make a custom bokeh. Uh, you could make it, save it into your shape library, and it'll be available. So these are all the different options that come with it. If you wanted um, monkey bokeh for some reason, there you go. All the other shape things will become... You might notice with some of these filters, it takes a long time to update. Uh, this is really processor intensive. There's our monkey bokeh. Um, you'll probably notice that your fan will start to spin. Um, and again, any shape you make or you have in your library, you can use as a fake aperture shape. So that's the, uh, the shape blur. The last two, the um, smart blur and surface blur. Surface blur is kind of like the opposite of unsharp mask. It looks for contrasting edges. And depending on what threshold you've got, it tries to leave them alone. Like maybe you want to soften the skin out, blur the skin, but you don't want to you know, blur the eyelashes, the texture in the fabric and stuff like that. It can be used as a starting point, but I'm not going to go over those because those are kind of more retouching things. Smart blur could be used to try to soften out noise in an image, but again, noise and image information, it's kind of ambiguous as to which is which. The software doesn't necessarily know, so your best bet is just not to get noise in the first place. Um, but this brings us to a whole other set of blurs in here. There's also the blur gallery. And all of these use the proper way of blurring things. You get circles of confusion. Like if I did the field blur here, it'll blur well, the entire field of vision, whatever is in your photograph. So in a sense, it doesn't really matter where you put this little thumbtack thing here. But if you bring up more blur, you can see that those out of focus things become actual circles, circles of confusion. And interestingly, down towards the bottom over here, we've got bokeh light bokeh, bokeh color, light range. If you were photographing something that had specular highlights in it, you guys know what specular highlights are? 
just basically really freaking bright highlights. Like let's say you were photographing at a car show and you know those 1950s cars with the chrome bumpers and the sun's reflecting off of it? Um, that's a specular highlight, very much so. If you tried to darken the exposure to the point where you didn't lose detail in the sun, like to the point where you could see like, you know, sunspots in the reflection, the rest of the image would be so dark it wouldn't be, there'd be no point taking that photograph. So a specular is just a really bright point of light. Like when we did that example with the flashlight, that little LED flashlight, that would be a specular highlight. When it focuses down, bing, right on your sensor, it'll blow out to white. Imagine beside that flashlight you had a candle. Um, if you focused both of them on your sensor, they'd probably both blow out. You might see a little bit of yellowish detail in the candle, but it would probably blow out to white in the center there. But then if you threw it out of focus, you started snipping off the tops of those cones, as the flashlight, which is really bright, um, made a larger circle, it would stay fairly bright. It's a very specular sort of highlight. But that dimmer candle would spread out and make a, a dimmer yellowish circle because uh, it's not nearly as bright. If something is a specular, it'll stay bright. And you can tell it with this, well, how bright should specular highlights stay? And also, which of these points should be considered speculars? So the light bokeh is how bright those specular highlights become. Um, and if they had a bit of color to begin with, if I turn this down, some of these stars are actually different colors. We've got little red ones and yellow ones. So you can tell them to keep some of their original color. Kind of funky. And the light range is telling it, well, how bright do the stars have to be to be considered uh, a specular highlight? So here I've got it at 249. So 249 to 255 will be considered a specular highlight. If I bring this down, more and more of those stars will be considered speculars. And if I take it too low, well, pretty much everything's going to be considered a specular. But that's kind of a neat little feature of the um, the blur tools up here. Now, the field blur, like I said, it blurs everything. This is the radius. This is how large those little circles of confusion are going to become. And you don't have to do it from here. This is actually kind of more fun. You'll see there's a little radius, little radial thing around here. You can grab that, less blur, or more, this is somehow more satisfying than just using the slider down there. Um, and there's other options as well. That was field blur. There's iris blur, which will throw a little aperture or an iris into the, the center of the image. And there's these four little circles in here which control where the midpoint is. If I pull them all the way to the outside, everything on the inside here is going to be sharp and in focus. If I pull them a little bit closer toward the center, now it's kind of like we're looking down a tunnel. Like imagine you were doing a, um, a trip down to the Caribbean and there was this lagoon with a, a little grotto, a cavern, a cave, and there was an opening in the cave and you were looking out across your boat off in the distance. You wanted your boat to be in focus, you wanted everything in the cave to be blurry. You could set this aperture to whatever size the opening in the rock was, pull this open, um, you can play around with the amount of blur with this little slider over here. Uh, if it was more of a rectangular shape, maybe you're looking out the window of something, you can grab this corner and pull it out into more of a rectangular shape. You can play with the midpoint. Maybe it's more of a, a tunnel of rock and you want that blur to extend all the way down. Notice how the sides of the circles of confusion get smaller as you get closer towards the center. This naturally follows how those circles of confusion would interact. Um, and you can have multiple apertures. Like here's this little first little iris over here. Uh, if I click over here, boink, it throws another one over down. This little dot here represents this first one. If I click on it, I can play around with its size, its angle. Uh, if I click on this one, I can play around with its size and its angle. Um, and if I throw another one in, you can have as many of these as you want. So maybe there are a bunch of openings in the rock, or maybe it was a, a wall, a, you know, a boat window, and there's like three portholes, and you want each of those to be able to see what's sharp outside. And another cool feature, if you move these things around, look at how they interact with each other in real time. That's kind of a neat little feature there. So that's the iris blur, and you can have as many of these little irises in here as you want. Um, have you guys ever heard of tilt shift? What is a tilt shift? It's a lens that will tilt and shift, yes. Um, I mentioned that I'm like really old, and when I was here, late 1900s, um, the, all of our studio stuff was done on a 4x5 view camera, and I still have mine actually, it's a Sinar F1, and you guys remember view cameras, they look like accordions, they have a piece of glass on the back, you put a cloth over your head so you can focus on the ground glass screen at the back, and they just store in fabulous ways. You can do swings, tilts, shifts, rises, falls on the front or the back. A tilt shift lens 
is less capable, uh, but it does a tilt where you can take that front element and you can tilt it back and forth, and you can do a shift. You can do a rise or a fall. Uh, the rise and the fall, the shifting is more for like architecture stuff. If you're photographing a tall building, instead of tilting your camera back, where you get that keystoning, that perspective issue, instead of tilting your camera back, you can do a rise. So you're still looking up at the building, but your image plane, lens plane, and sensor plane remain parallel. But the tilt, that's one of the cool things about this. And you might have seen uh, what some people call the miniature effect. Miniature effect. Where if you're photographing, let's say, a street scene, um, your camera might be focused from, say, you know, 15 feet to infinity. So if you're like, you know, up on a building looking out at a scene, everything's going to be sharp. It's all going to be in focus. When you're looking at stuff far away, your depth of field is huge. When you get closer to stuff, your depth of field gets shallower. If you've ever tried to like use a macro lens to take a picture of a fly, you might get like a thin slice of the fly's eye. Maybe get like one or two millimeters of depth of field. So if you were photographing a model train set, it looks like real stuff, houses, mountains, cars, people, but the depth of field will be really shallow. The tilt shift filter or a tilt shift lens lets you actually play around with your depth of field and kind of simulate that very shallow depth of field. Here's, what do we got here? Well, there you go, miniature effect. Oh, it looks like a little cute little kid's toy thing, except it's an actual photograph. Those are real people, those are real cars. It's that simulation of a really shallow depth of field. Um, and there's a whole lot more you can do with tilt shift lenses as well. There was a band, uh, Susie and the Banshees. They had an album, do I have that? And this is an image that they took. I don't know if it was a four by five or a tilt shift lens, but you'll notice how it's in focus up here and then it falls off as you go down the image. I actually was inspired by this when I was in college. I did a portrait of my cousin where I took the lens and I tilted it forward. And we're used to our depth of field being parallel with the plane of our film and our, our lens. So let's say you had a newspaper stuck to a wall and you wanted to photograph the newspaper, you had a large aperture, maybe like one inch of depth of field, you could get everything on that newspaper top to bottom in focus. But let's say you, you put the newspaper on a tabletop and now you've got, you know, a two foot tall newspaper, you've got one inch of depth of field, you might only get three or four or five lines of type in focus. But if you tilt your lens forward, your depth of field will also tip forward. In fact, it'll tip more than you tilt your lens. You can actually get your depth of field flat on horizontal. So if you get your depth of field horizontal, one inch of depth of field could get that whole newspaper top to bottom in focus. And here's where it gets really cool. Imagine you set a mug on top of that newspaper with like some pens or a flower or something in it. With that one inch of depth of field, the newspaper's in focus, the bottom of the mug is in focus, and as you go up the mug, it gets progressively softer. So here's where they've tipped the lens forward, their depth of field is now on an angle, and by having the swath of focus across the eyes, as it goes down the body, it goes progressively less out of focus. I did a portrait of my cousin where she was like this, and I focused on the eyes, and I, I shifted it as far as it would go, big aperture, and by the time it got to her chin, it was like a ghostly, and it just kind of faded off to nothing towards the bottom there. So that miniature effect, that tilt shift lens, simulates that sort of look. Like if I did a filter, blur gallery, tilt shift, you notice you get that swath of focus, and then there's four lines, two white lines, anything in between the white lines will be in focus. Anything outside the dotted lines will be out of focus by whatever radius you've got set. And anything in between the dotted and the solid lines is a transition in between. So you can get the inner swath of focus larger. You can play around with the angle of it. You can get the transition line narrower or larger. You can move the whole thing around. And let me just quickly show you on a different image Lens blur. There's a mountain off in the distance, nice and sharp and in focus. There's some trees, nice and sharp and in focus. There's some buildings here, nice and sharp and in focus. Everything in the scene is nice and sharp and in focus. But what if I did that tilt shift filter? And what if I put the line of focus so that it went right across these buildings here? And brought that up so it has a little bit of more of a oomph to it. Yeah. And then I hit OK on that. Now it kind of looks like maybe it is a little model train set with like a little plastic house sitting on the hill. Now there are a few issues with it, like the top of this tree and the bottom of the tree are in the same plane, so there's no technical reason why the top would be blurry and the bottom wouldn't be. You don't really get to tell it how far away things are, at least not in this filter. We'll take a look at another one that actually does let you do it. Um, but you, you can kind of simulate that miniature sort of effect. 
back to the star field. The last two I want to show you in the blur gallery, filter, blur, blur gallery, uh, path blur. Maybe you're photographing in the forest and there's a little stream coming down through the, through the forest floor there. And it's a bright day, so the you know, slowest shutter speed you can do is a 250th of a second. And you don't have a neutral density filter with you to make a, a longer exposure. You guys know about neutral density filters? It's like sunglasses for your camera. Um, and with a long exposure, if you did like a, a stream at like 15 seconds or a 10 second exposure, you get this sense of motion of the water kind of snaking through. At a fast shutter speed, you see the bubbles, you see the little droplets and stuff. With the path blur, you can specify a path. Um, you can specify a bend to the path. You can add more paths into there. You can bend those paths around. You can have like a little piece of uh, a rock in the middle of the water and you can bend this around and, and suddenly you get the water going around and swirling and you can make some really cool effects with it that way. Or you could simply, um, I guess, simulate Rembrandt Starry Night. So that's the path blur. You can have as many of these little paths in here as you need and when you render it out, again, might take a while. Oh, if you're running these filters a lot and you find that you're sitting there waiting for this thing to render out, in your preferences under general, you'll notice this used to be on by default, this thing that says beep when done. Back when computers were a lot slower, even a simple Gaussian blur could take a few minutes to render. Um, so beep when done was turned on by default. So when you started a filter, you'd go off, do something else, and your computer would beep when it was done, and you'd come back and keep working. So if you find you're running a lot of filters that are taking a long time, you can turn on the beep when done, and it'll, well, it'll beep when it's done. Um, so that's the path blur. And the last one, filter blur gallery, is the spin blur where it uh, spins. It's a lot like the radial blur, except where the radial blur does the entire document in a circle, this does a small selected area, and it doesn't have to be a circle. It could be an oval, it could be uh, a black hole spinning in space, or whatever. And same deal, you can pull it up to a more, you know, a larger shape, you can um, change the, the transition point. So you can put that spin blur on there as well. Now getting back to the lens blur filter, I'm gonna call up this one here, and let's take a look at it. Under filter, blur, and this morning I used the joke of, I don't know who this, this lens guy is, but he has a heck of a blur. It didn't go over well. So I'm just gonna say, let's look at the lens blur filter. And by default, you'll notice, first off, it does use the circles of confusion. Um, so it is a natural bokeh shape. You can also change, actually I should show you on the star field because you can change the shape of the aperture. Not in terms of making like boxes or, or ducks or anything, but filter, blur, lens, blur. Let's say you were trying to match uh, something that had been photographed on a Hasselblad, which has a five-bladed aperture. So the bokeh on a Hasselblad is pentagonal. So you can set a pentagon. And if you, a little bit larger, we'll zoom in there a bit, you can see that each of these little bokeh things is a pentagon. So you can play around with um, the rotation of each of those little pentagons. The blade curvature, now most manufacturers on the apertures, whether it's a six, seven, or whatever bladed aperture, they'll have a slight curve to it so it does make a rounder, more circular bokeh. And if you pull the blade curvature all the way out, it really kind of doesn't matter how many blades you say it should have. Uh, it's gonna be a circle anyway. But if you want hexagonal, pentagonal, whatever, you can change the shape of the bokeh. You got the same specular highlights option here. You can bring up the brightness of those speculars, uh, how bright they have to be to be considered a specular. This one's a little bit more intense when you get down to around there. Um, but same sort of idea. You can see that hexagonal shape, pentagonal, whatever you want it to be, play around with the rotation. It's all good fun. But the real feature of this, let's say you had, um, you're doing a story on hot dog vendors in New York City and you know like 30 feet down the sidewalk there there's a guy a hot dog vendor and a guy buying a hot dog from him you want that to be the focal point of the image and there's some people in front there's some people behind and there's some buildings off in the distance if you just did a tilt shift you could get a swath of sharpness across like what the guy's face maybe um, anything to the side would be sharp you want depth and in the case of this image here when we did the tilt shift it kind of wasn't all that convincing, like, you know, the top of this tree was blurry, but then the bottom of it was sharp, and there's no reason why that would be the case. If you make a depth map, and that sounds really complex, but with this one here, you'll notice there's a layer mask on the file, so part of it is invisible. This could also be used as a depth mask. Like, if I zoom in here, notice that there's this um, power line kind of thing behind the building, uh, these little towers on top. Anything you paint with black 
won't get any blur when you run the lens blur filter. Anything that is left white will get fully blurred. Anything that you've covered with some kind of a shade of gray will have less blur. So if I were to select the layer itself, not the layer mask, but the layer, the image, and then I go under filter, blur, lens blur, and I tell it by default it's at none, so everything gets equally blurred, but if I tell it to use the layer mask as a depth map, look at what happens. This building stays sharp. The power line behind it stays sharp. This tree, which is the same shade of gray, gets the same amount of blur. So you can really set the depth with that mask. So imagine on that uh, street scene of the hot dog vendor guy, you paint the hot dog vendor and the guy buying the hot dog completely black. The people in front, you paint them 50% gray. The people behind, you paint them 50% gray. And you leave the buildings off in the distance completely white. You get this very natural looking fall off of sharpness. It simulates that very shallow depth of field. So very cool effect. I think that about covers it for the blur. And let me just show you some examples of what students have done in the past. We'll start with this one here, uh, which actually kind of ended up, this is the original image, and just a little bit of radial blur would uh, actually kind of look kind of tragic, like a, a, a rollover accent, so we got rid of that one. Um, but then we talked about this one. In the original image, she was already using that shallow depth of field. She'd focused on, looks to be um, uh, dried uh, Queen Anne's lace, and in the background we've got the bokeh, the out of focus stuff, and you might have noticed sometimes in bokeh you get these hard edges. If something is out of focus, like this little snowflake that's got not just motion blur, but also bokeh, every bit of that line gets kind of that circular shape applied to it. And that's why you get those kind of hard edges in something that you would think should be completely out of focus. See this kind of hard edge, well that's something that's out of focus. Uh, this is a little bit larger. There's the circles that make their way along. So you got some motion blur with this snow falling and that out of focus circles of confusion, that bokeh in the background. But what she did was took it a step further and made the whole thing kind of an abstraction of itself. So now the subject is very definitely these little dried plants in here. In the original image, it's a car parked on the side of the road uh, with a little bit of blur added though, it becomes a car pulling away from the sidewalk. And then it was like, well, there's no driver in this. We decided that was also a little bit disturbing, but you do get that sense of motion. So we'll get rid of that one as well. The original image, full color, non-destructive adjustment layers to turn into a grayscale and to give a sense of motion, a little bit of a radial blur. And again, they've used this layer mask to kind of hide the blur to bring back some of the sharpness. Now it might be a little bit overdone, on the face, but no problem, layer masks can always be edited. So we could grab a paintbrush with some black paint and we could ease some of that blur off of that area, leaving it intact in the rest of the image. So you get a nice sense of movement across that image there. Um, this one is surprisingly cool, actually. You might look at it and think, well, yeah, but this, like, you know, instead of a circle, it's become a ring. Bokeh doesn't become a ring. It does if you have a special kind of lens called a mirror lens. You guys talked about mirror lenses? Imagine you had like a, a telephoto lens, you know, like a you know, 500 millimeter, a 1500 millimeter lens. It'd be like, like really long. Um, but telescopes use lenses, right? And some telescopes use mirrors. They're much shorter, they can be much larger and gather quite a lot of light. And the way a mirror lens works, just the same way a telescope works, you've got this lens, the light comes through, hits a mirror in the back, gets reflected forward to another mirror, which then reflects the light through some more lens elements onto the sensor. Though, although something has to hold this mirror in place, and that's this little disc in here. So you notice there's a little disc in a mirror lens, and the bokeh of a mirror lens actually looks like that ring shape, because the light comes through basically a ring-shaped aperture. So on this image, I don't think they knew about mirror lenses when they did it, but that's what it would look like had you photographed this with a mirror lens. There is a little bit of a paradox in that this appears to have been photographed with a wide angle lens and mirror lenses are usually quite telephoto. But I also really liked the pattern that these lights made. If you look at the original image, these are just little LED lights along the side of the arms there. And because each one becomes a ring, these rings overlap and you get these kind of like, you know, mock dark lines inside. I just thought that was kind of cool and kind of an interference pattern in the center there. And any of the standalone bright lights become a ring sort of shape. That was kind of cool. I liked that one. Uh, here's another example of a Ferris wheel. This is the London Eye in, well, London. And, you know, on its own, it's just kind of sitting there waiting for, you know, the people to get on. Um, they added a little bit of spin to it, which I thought maybe was going a bit fast. This actually becomes a very real possibility. This is actually, this is actually a photo of it a few seconds before it snapped off and rolled to France. 
so there you go. So be careful. Like, it, you know, make it realistic. A little bit less of a, a rotation might have been a little bit more realistic on that image there. This I thought was kind of cool. Um, I mean, records are making a bit of a comeback, but this is from a few years back when records weren't you know as popular as they are now. And if you look at the original image, it's a record store. And where's the focus? You know, is it the person taking a picture here? And actually, if you look in the mirror, you say, well, where's the person who took the picture? Is this the per No, this is this person right here. The photographer is this person back here. And we can only see that because they're in focus. But look what they've done with the blur. Now, all of this becomes soft, not important. Your, your eye tends to be drawn to the sharper parts of the image. There's, these, there's rows of records across here, and these people leaving the store, kind of a, a portent of things to come, except that uh, they've made a comeback. But I, I thought it was kind of neat. They've kind of, you can make a statement just by drawing the focus. This kind of depth of field could never happen in real life, but using this to kind of draw the attention kind of makes a neat little um, story to the image. Um, this one here, again, the original image, it's just some people holding up the skirt in a kind of an awkward fashion, a little bit of a spin, and suddenly you get that sense that she's really spinning around. Again, maybe a little bit too fast, you risk taking somebody's eye out, um, but that's just the um, spin blur. The motion blur, without it, just, you know, they're kind of resting, holding as best you can, but with that motion blur, you get a sense of those cards kind of flying from one hand to the other, so it can be used to add a bit of dynamic motion to an image. It can also be used... Um, to give that kind of soft dreamy effect. Soft focus filters. They used to be more popular than they are now. You guys ever heard of the Koken filters? It's um, a mount that you put onto your camera and, and square filters that you can slide into it. And, you know, soft focus filters were quite popular. Did anybody ever watch Murder, She Wrote? Some people might call it the Angela Lansbury filter. Um, she was on the older side when she, they filmed that show. And oftentimes when they were showing the, her character, Jessica Fletcher, there was this kind of soft, dreamy quality, like you kind of got going around here. Uh, the rest of the characters were perfectly sharp, so you might hear it called the Angela Lansbury filter. But here's the original image, nice and sharp and crispy. And what they've done here is a blurred version of the image, and then they used a layer mask to basically lower the opacity. Like if you just duplicate a layer, Command J, run a blur, filter, blur, other lens, or probably more likely a Gaussian blur for an actual soft focus filter and bring its opacity down, you can get that kind of hazy, dreamlike quality to it. Uh, and that's basically what he's done here, kind of simulated that. And then he threw some type on for the dream. So that's kind of a soft focus effect. Again, the original image, not that exciting, somebody coming out a back door, but suddenly, drama, what's going to happen? You're curious. And again, just that layer mask bringing back the sharpness across the areas that you didn't want that blur to be on. Faking depth of field. In the original image, they do have that shallow depth of field. You can see that the background is out of focus. You can see those kind of circles of confusion. Um, notice how the, uh, the tiles become a, a bit of a wider, the grout between, and kind of a, a square sort of shape as those circles overlap. This is in focus, nice and sharp. The background's a little bit out of focus, a little bit blurred. And here they've added kind of some fake depth of field to it. Now be careful if you're using this to simulate depth of field. Like they kind of caught it a little bit on the corners of the product. It's sharp here, a little bit blurry on the side. Sometimes just a little bit more uh, caution with the masking can help with stuff like that. Um, so there's it kind of used to, to fake the depth of field. Although you are getting this weird combination of in focus and out of focus. Whereas if it was totally out of focus, you wouldn't get that kind of sharpness mixed with. That's more like a, a soft focus effect that's going on in there. So just be careful if you're trying to use it to, to fake the depth of field. Or even you can turn it into an abstraction. You kind of like, you know, what kind, you know what's going on with this figure here? It, without the blur, it's just kind of somebody standing looking really cold and possibly about to fall into the lake. Uh, but with it, it becomes kind of an abstraction of itself. And actually, uh, I had an example years ago of uh, someone had done a rotation on their dog and it looked really disturbing, so I got rid of that. Um, but you can, you can use it to make like an abstraction of its original. Like that Ferris wheel with the rings you might not even necessarily recognize it as a Ferris wheel. So play around with some of these different tools. Oh, this is actually the last one I wanted to show you. Um, the original image, kind of static, just like some goop in the bottom of a bowl. They added a little bit of a radial blur, and it gave a sense of this motion in here. And they even let it bleed into the background. I thought that was kind of neat. Here's the original, sharper around. They even let that motion blur radiate into the background. So it does, you do get a bit of that roundness to it. But this is where the focus is drawn. You can see the layer mask is revealing it, mostly in the center here. And you get the sense that it's mixing that up. You get a sense of motion in the image. So she could have done it with a slower shutter speed. She could throw it in afterwards. Dig around your images. Try a whole bunch of stuff. Try all the different filters. And your favorite ones, save them up into a new folder. Last name, first name, week.